Hello everybody, welcome to Owen Automotive. This is the final episode of the Preservation E-Type and I've been working late today trying to get this thing ready and out the door. So yeah, there it is inside the shop on the hoist. Let's get into it. First up in this episode is the exhaust. So we're looking at a lot of nice stainless steel here, made in England from a company called Bell. And Bell manufactured this exhaust system to the original factory specification. It's just not made of mild steel anymore. Now the original early cars, they had these really long, beautiful resonators that you see underneath the belly pan kind of sticking out. So those look fabulous. They've been polished as they should be. And yeah, those are gonna look lovely sticking out the back. Now I'm gonna geek out here a little bit. I'm gonna go with the original style clamps. Lucky for us, Jaguar Land Rover Classic have reproduced the original style pinch bolt clamps that put together this exhaust system. And you see we need four of this one here, one, three, oh, six, three, and two of these ones. See, one, eight, one, nine, six. Downpipes are in there just loose. You see the eight brass nuts there holding them on. They'll need to be retorqued after a few heat cycles. That's pretty normal. Now the main muffler system sits right here on these four rubber mounts. See the mounts right here? So I'll be putting that on next. And one thing I really wanted to make sure I had buttoned up too is the handbrake cable. It's actually held on with a spring here. You see the spring that holds it away from the drive shaft. And this is the rearmost mount right here with a little safety on it. Look at that, the exhaust is in. Beautiful stainless system shining back at me. But I'm not gonna lie, it was a fight. These downpipes are really a struggle to get clearance. They clear the engine well, see that? And they clear the torsion bars really well, but they just seem to not mingle very well. There's a tiny gap here, I think it's enough. And it gets really tight right here as well. So I was really fighting the downpipes for clearance just, of them, just to themselves. They're the clamps here, these original style clamps from JLR. I love them. They work really good with inch and three quarter inch pipe. Go down to the back here, you can see the resonators. And the tangs on the resonators were too wide. They didn't accept the original bracket. You can see the safety hook there, just in case this rear mount lets go. And I really wanted to make sure we were centered. That's the biggest part about this whole thing. And it's looking pretty good. So yeah, we can move on. All right, back to the top side. Just putting the final few items in before we get this motor flashed up. I'm working on the cooling system. So I'm gonna put the radiator in right here. You can see the two brackets there with holes in them that hold the radiator to the subframe. And it's a real bad idea to jack up on that subframe because it'll push the radiator up and into the hood. My dad's at the same time, he's working on the spark plugs and ignition system. So you can see the original ignition wire holder there curving around. And we have the new cardboard holder for the wire. So just getting that all mocked up. The original distributor's down in there. It's actually dated from 1961. It's been fully rebuilt by S&G Barrett. Okay, go over to the bench here, see what we're working with. A lot of cooling components to go on the car. Down here is the original aluminum radiator out of the E-Type. You can see it's made by this company, Marston Excelsior. And it's made with a very special process where the heater matrix is kind of combined with the side tanks. And they don't make radiators like this anymore. But lucky for us, there's this company called Fossway Performance. You can see the decal down there. And they're a manufacturing company that makes a host of really amazing upgrades for E-types, really high-end kind of stuff. This radiator just looks totally amazing. I think it'll be a nice piece to go in the E-type, that's for sure. Now, if we go up to the top here, we can see the header tank for the radiator. We've got a new one here in the auto switch. Now, these are the cheapo Italian auto switches that you can get from everywhere else. And lucky for us, Fossway, they also make 
a high, per a high performance adapted piece. Sorry, you can see it here. So we have a high performance otter switch and an adapter plate for it. And that's really nice because those junky Italian ones, I don't have a lot of faith in them. You know, at the same time, we're gonna upgrade the cooling fan. So this is a pretty popular upgrade called the Cool Cat 16 inch fan, multi-bladed with a new motor in there. And I've persevered with the original style single blade cooling fan solutions. And there's nothing wrong with the, with the cooling fan, but I find the old motors, they bake out pretty often. I've gone through three in my own E-type. So this is a nice new modern upgrade with a lot more CFM. And uh, I think it's a good way to go with this car. Is this gonna go? Making progress here. Just buttoning up this radiator. You can see how it's mounted. There's this bracket here that's on rubber and the radiator itself is on rubber. So it's isolated from the chassis. And you see the way the shroud here works with the new Cool Cat cooling fan in there. We also got the generator in. This is the original generator to the car. It's been rebuilt with the regulator. You see that second month of 62. And also got the original coil on here with the original coil bracket. Second month of 62. And yeah, so we're gonna put the header tank on next right here. But let's just go have a look on the other side before we put it in. On the passenger side, just a few things to look at. Got the relay here, the original relay in its right spot. Had to put this breather tube in place. So you got these seven eighths clamps on this elbow and this narrow gauge breather tube. The later ones are, are definitely a little larger and it has a clip there that has to be hooked on. So it pops out right here. This is actually the original hose right there on the breather tube. And my dad's been doing the distributor with the ignition wires. You can see the routing here, it has a clip up near the water pump. And then it has this conduit that runs up and over and you get the traditional looking champion caps on there. All right, today is the day. We're gonna start this motor first time in over 40 years. Just wanna give a quick tour of what we've installed since we were here last. One is these coolant hoses. You can see they're cloth wrapped. These are from Fosway. They're actually silicone, which is pretty neat. And they mimic the original design. See, this is the original hose right here. Kind of has this wrap texture to it. And those worked out really well. So thanks, Fosway. We also included their high-end otter switch. You can see that poking here on the top. It's better than the cheaper Italian alternatives. And we'll just go to the battery here. You saw me drilling out the terminals in the battery for these lead connectors, just keeping it totally original. And this is an original battery hold down as well with the Mickey Mouse ear nuts. So yeah, next up, we're gonna fill this thing full of fuel, oil, and coolant. And we'll see if we got pressure in the motor. Okay, so we're gonna put the fuel in the tank. We can see I got the pump here. This is the pump that's in the tank. Only the early cars have them in the tank. And we can see we have a new line running. All the fittings are cadmium plated. We have a new sender that's mated to the original wiring harness. And interestingly enough, the fuel pumps connected down this little box. I don't know if they were concerned about it heating up and an explosion or whatnot, but you don't see these with the later cars. It's kind of a neat design feature, the early cars. So let's go over here and put some fuel in this thing, or petrol as it were. Okay, I wanna put coolant in the engine. Lots to talk about, because I'm using Evans, a waterless coolant. So this has a lot of advantages and one disadvantage we'll get into. And the first advantage is that it's a waterless system. So it doesn't corrode. This is aluminum and cast iron engine. So it's nice not to see any corrosion. The second major, major, sorry, the second major advantage is that it's waterless. So having no water means no pressure, means no boil over. I mean, Evans, this Evans coolant boils at 375 degrees. So you won't get the typical problem where the engine gets hot, it loses all the coolant out of the cylinder head and warps like a banana, which I really like. So what is the disadvantage? It's heat transfer. When you run Evans, it doesn't have water in it and the heat transfer is less. So on a system like this, where we have an upgraded aluminum radiator and an upgraded cooling fan, it's totally acceptable and it's a way to go. But if you're having cooling system problems, 
but Evans isn't the way to go. And one little trick here is that I'm putting this in and I have the temperature sender out so I don't need to burp the system. I can fill it right up to the top and then close out the system with the temperature sender and it'll be good to go. Thing. That pumps a little buzzer. Yeah, smooth. Really nice, Mike. It does, doesn't it? It's very steady. Yeah. What was the oil pressure? 40. 40. Oh, good. It's just what we want. All right, one last look underneath. Lots of progress here. Got the original hub cab plated. My dad put these in with the new rotors. These are a Delphi rotor. They've been balanced. See that slot cut out in them? So nice high end parts. Coney shock absorbers. Yeah, really nice to use the high-end materials here. Now I put in the splash shields. What's nice about these is I was the first person to take them apart so I could put the original hardware right back in. See these kind of these body screws and the black oxide washers. And an interesting detail with the strapping that holds these splash shields onto the engine subframe. Now I finally know how they should go and the straps kind of go underneath the splash shield, if you know what I mean. You see it right there. And the other thing is the finish so this is an unfinished part. It definitely was high gloss black. So on this splash shield here, I kind of emulated that. You can see the original paint and grime of the car here. Definitely creates an interesting contrast. And this car is full of contrast like this, where you get the original fits and finishes and the new parts and mechanical systems. It's kind of intriguing and I'm learning something new every day. Take for instance, this piece of wood. I think this is the original wood in the car because those straps there, they've never been out. And that's not what we typically see on the later cars. See the braking system here, all new and renewed with wheel cylinders. Pistons looking lovely. Now this is the wheel and tire of choice that I've fallen in love with as of late. It's a Michelin XVS, made it with the MWS wire wheel. And these have balanced up really well. The last few sets have just been a dream. So I highly recommend this tubeless system for the Jaguars, that's for sure. Yeah, now that I've finished up the trunk area, I think now is a good time as any to show everybody the tools that originally came with this car. These are the original tools with the car and they do live in this trunk space. So I think it's pretty neat to show them. So this is the main tool roll. You can see it's kind of a canvas roll with this backing that's all falling apart. That's really normal. Now, a lot of all these tools should be black oxide. We can see the Dunlop tire gauge I found actually inside the car. And I stuck the pencil I found in there from the factory. I think that's pretty neat. Uh, what can we say? So the adjustable wrench, that's usually the one that everybody wants to see. So here we see it's a Garrington's and it says Jaguar on the other side. We have a pair of pliers here. Uh, can't see anything on those. And the spanners, sometimes they're always mismatched. We've got a Garrington's. We got a, oh, here we go, a TW or an E to TW. We got a Garrington's. 
and a another Garrington. Jaguar just grabbed whatever they had available, so that's pretty normal. Here is the drop snout jack, very rare, worth a lot of money. I think that's the original color there. See that kind of greeny gray? That's really neat. What's also pretty cool is the original bar that actuates the jack. It fits in these clips right here in the bottom of the car. That's pretty cool. And this has to be the original Thor hammer. Looking really nice. He definitely has a black painted top. Copper on one side, rawhide on the other. Get those knockoffs, uh, wheels off. See, so yeah, that's a selection of tools. Oh yeah, and there's actually a cam setting tool in here as well. So that's the full complement of tools that originally came with this car and they're staying right where they belong. How sweet is that? There it is. Wow. Move under, moving under its own power, first time in 45 years. How about that? Got the idle nice and smooth. I'm really happy with the running condition of that engine. Really impressive build by the engine builder. And it runs super smooth down the low RPM. So I'm really curious to see what things, what this thing's gonna perform like on the road. Now I've just tidied up a whole long laundry list of items, but let's just show everybody here what this engine bay looked like before it was taken apart. Now this car wasn't taken apart by me. And you know, looking at these photos, there's a lot of rust and corrosion around. But now we come back to what we have here, and it's remarkable just cleaning up the components, what a difference it really makes. Now I had to finish up a couple things. One, one thing was I put the capacitor for the coil right there, and that meant the ignition wires actually, actually wrapped over and around the right hand cam cover. And I also tightened up the bushings in the lower control arm and upper control arms. That has to be done while the car's sitting with the weight on it. That's super important. Now, I really want to get the intake plenium on, but the engine rebuilder, he chucked away the original oil sender, which is a real shame because if it worked, it would have been calibrated nicely with the dash. So I'm on a mission to find one that works, but if for any reason on this test drive, you see that the oil pressure gauge doesn't work, that's because uh, we have a gauge, external gauge here attached to the motor. But I will take this opportunity to look at the intake plenium. I have it here, it's the original one, the original finishes. This is the original AC can. It looks like it's satin black to me. That doesn't look like gloss, gloss black. So that's kind of a deviation from what we see. That's because these were built by AC. Uh, the tags on the other side. Now the plenium itself here is really neat. It's a hammer tone finish. That's the original finish. How sweet is that? The trumpets are also hammer tone as well. We've got the mouse ear wing nuts. Yeah, really sweet original piece. Want to leave these original fits and finishes as much as we can. No, I, I admit I, we did refinish all the small hardware though and uh, that really just cheers it up. Okay, this next part of the video is dedicated to all those people that exclaimed I needed a new wiring harness in this car. It was gonna be dangerous and burn up in flames or something like that, which is totally untrue. We'll just do a tour here. So yeah, the ignition worked properly. My uh, interior lights on, my brake fluid reservoir lights are working. Blinkers, got blinkers. Look at that, they're working. Both sides, yep. This is after 45 years of dry storage, remember? Got wipers. See if they park. There they go, that works great. Uh, fan. Fan motor works. And lights. Awesome. How about the horn? I can hear it clicking. Yeah, so pretty remarkable. Radio? Oh, it's buzzing at me. So yeah, pretty remarkable. You know these systems after... 45 years of dry storage, they're just fine, no problem whatsoever. 
I'm actually think that this is safer and less risky than actually putting in a whole new wiring harness and risking crossing two wires and causing a dead short. So there we go. Really happy with the performance of this wiring harness, but I'm not surprised. Look in the engine bay. The harness was totally intact. It was, uh, it wasn't modified at all. And so that's what we get a nice running car. Gauge is working, speedo's working, 67,000 original miles. Awesome. Well, that does it for this video. Uh, thanks for following along, everybody. This definitely was one of the most enjoyable and important e-types of my life. And I really hope that future custodians will honor the work we've seen in this video and not mess around with that engine bay too much and leave some of the original fits and finishes. You know, when it comes to custom and the exterior of the car, I haven't done anything. I didn't touch anything, didn't touch a paint, didn't touch the interior, so it still appears just as it did when it was pulled out of the barn uh, two years ago. And it would be nice to keep it that way, but I know the temptation is there. The, there's a temptation to paint the hood and paint the driver's door, and then when you get into that, you get into the chrome, you get into the rubber, maybe you take out the glass, take off the hood, maybe strip down the hood and the doors and the rear hatch, and then soon you're into a complete rebuild, and then it would be no different than any other restored 62. So yeah, it's been a journey. Uh, it's kind of sad to be finished this project, but we have to move on. Um, I guess, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody involved directly and indirectly with this project. You know who you are, and it's been an absolute pleasure. And that's it for this video. So thanks for watching, everybody. As always, if you have any tips, tricks, comments, or trade secrets, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. All right, that's it. See you later. Bye-bye.